Uh, welcome back to another Impact from Matter Impact Education Leadership. This is episode 147. I'm your host, Adi P. For Isaiah Drum on Thursday night, panelists are Eric Court, Kegway Porter, and Charles B.C. Caldwell. Charles B.C. Caldwell, please say hello to the people, sir. Hello, everyone. This is Big C. Caldwell coming at you from Mansfield, Texas, adolescent to adults. And my motto is experience is the only situation where you get to test before the lesson. Mm-mm-mm. It's going to be a monster tonight. And Tangere Porter, please say hello to the people. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. As you have heard my name, my name is Tangere Porter, spelled exactly like it's pronounced. Um, I am the founder of Cultivated Connections Design and Consulting, where we mandate something different. We are a culturally inclusive arts curricula and arts uh, integrated program uh, where we go and help teachers, educators, parents mandate something different from the students and their, their children to bring creativity into their lives. I'm so excited to be here, y'all. Wow. And we got the legendary Eric Cork. Please say hello again to the people. Well, hello, people. Listening right now, this is Eric Cork, and I want you to know my goal in life when I grow up is to be just like Charles Big C. Caldwell. That's what I want to do. That's my goal in life. And Isaiah Drone. If I can be a combination of those two brothers, I'll be all right. <laughs> I, I teach writing courses and writing camps all over the United States. I'm in 45 states and five different countries. And I guess if I had a motto is if your students are not learning the way you teach, then teach the way they learn. Basically, that's just that simple. And I have the biggest compliment that I get is I have 500 students for six straight hours, and the principals come up to me and say, only two kids asked to use the restroom all day out of 500 students. Only two in six hours asked to get up and go to the back because they were scared they were going to miss something. And so I guess I'm the poster boy for engagement and keeping students involved Amen. and raising test scores all over the country. So that's what I do. Mm-mm-mm. I say amen to that. Tonight, the word is going to be, it has to be for me with this group tonight, with this time tonight, the word tonight is connection. But the topic tonight is parental involvement beyond extracurricular activities. Sports are the most popular extracurricular activity for kids and about 7 in 10 parents. That's like 73%. With at least one child ages 6 to 17 say that children participate in sports or athletic activities, parents seem to have a stronger bond with their children when they are involved in extracurricular activities, which in most cases are just as important as formal education, but yet for some reason parents are more motivated when their kids are involved in sports. Many children thrive on those activities and can gain the needed confidence to succeed in the classroom. However, parents must also connect with teachers to ensure that as parents, they keep their young scholars involved in their academics. Learning results from associations between stimuli and responses, almost like a cause and effect type thing, right? Such associations form habits. These habits become strengthened or weakened by the nature or repetition of a particular pattern. When a student's patterns or trends are noticed, it becomes more attainable to discover their SWOT analysis. That's their strengths, their weaknesses, their opportunities, their trends, and their threats. So high involvement in turn identifies the student's challenges and goal settings to make them become more intentional about growth. Tonight we got a panel for you for this topic. I believe everybody on the panel uh, is not only a public speaker, a professional speaker, uh, some some are professional athletes uh, and some are professional entertainers. And so I, I believe this topic is perfect. Uh, first, I want to ask Big C, Caldwell, uh, you know, what came to your mind when I gave you this topic, sir? What was the first thing that came to your mind? The first thing that came to my mind is that the Holy Spirit is floating because I have been touched ever since we had this mass shooting in Uvalde, Texas, to go on a crusade in which I am going to do uh, probably after the 4th of July, going to different cities, soliciting mentors and volunteers to get more involved with our communities and our schools because we've strayed away from it takes a village. We knew when 
old school out of Southeast Arkansas, if you said a bad word on the other side of town, you got beat down by that person and they call your family and you got beat down when you came home. We can't do that anymore, but we can at least intervene. What's happening now is that people are afraid to say something to the kids. We got to get more back involved. We got to get involvement back. That's what came to mind. E. That's good. And Eric Court, I want to answer that same question. What came to your mind, Mr. Eric Court, when you first heard the topic for tonight's discussion? Well, first of all, I want to say thank you for inviting me and including me on everything that you do. Isaiah Drone, you are the man, and I appreciate it. I feel honored. And I want to say the first thing that crossed my mind was that um, it's a two-way street. When you talk about parental involvement because parents aren't saints and neither are teachers. So parents have things that they need to improve on and, and so do the teachers and administrators in involving parents. So um, I want to talk about more or less the positive things and not really the negative things or the things that want, that they need to do better, but what's already working in terms of best practices. So I just kind of thought about to answer your question that it is a two-way street. Things that parents need to do to step up their game and things that schools need to do to step up their game to make parents feel more involved. Uh, with their kids, so that's what crossed my mind when you when I saw the topic tonight. Wow, I say amen to that. And you know you're the man. Anytime Oprah Winfrey stops what she's doing to make sure you're taken care of, you are the man. Uh, but uh, thank you for that, sir. I want to go to uh, Tangent Reporter answer that same question. What came to your mind when you first heard the topic for tonight? Just to build on the top of these awesome and amazing kings that are on this. I too thought about like it takes a village and it's also a two-way street. But one thing as a, a educator myself, I immediately thought about just communication and resources. I've had parents to come to me and say, well, Miss Porter, I don't know how to do this or how do you do X, Y, and Z. So I think, you know, as soon as I saw this topic, my, my mind immediately went to, well, what are some communica communicative things we can do with the parents? What are some resources? we can give them um, to, you know, continue cultivating that that parent involvement inside and outside of extracurricular activities. Wow, that's important. It's so important. You know, Big C, you talked about the school shootings that's been going on in our schools. And, you know, we need to have people that are keen, people that are in tune to our students, to our scholars, so that we can see what's going on with them. And it takes professionals to come in externally to come into the school sometimes because if you're looking, if you're looking at a fish tank from outside that fish tank, you can see what's going on in that environment better than the fish can because you got a different perspective, right? And so with your perspective, I want to ask you this question. How, with your experience and with your, uh, through your lens, how do we bridge, how do we bridge the parental involvement? Because that's a huge gap right there. And you can say it was before COVID-19, post COVID-19, but what we do know is uh, the gap exists. There's a gap between families, especially those families in high poverty school environments. What are some ways based off of your experience, that we can begin to bridge or close that gap between families and, and schools, especially those in high poverty schools. What's your thoughts? Thank you for this opportunity, my brother. And I want to start off with numbers. I heard you mention the COVID, pre-COVID, but I have been doing my homework prior to my crusade. And let me state this. Since 1999, the Columbine, there have been 300,000 shootings at schools in the United States of America at 360 different schools. This only happens in America. The world news never say anything about no other country in the world. Kids are being shot at school unless it's at a war. And of course, they want to put that out there for propaganda, which is all good. But my question is, what can we do to get education and parental involvement? I've already spoke on environment. Here's the thing, and I heard you say, you know, resources. You referred to resources. You said poverty. Here's my first statement. Regardless of the income of the household, whether there's one parent, two parents, grandparents, 
foster parents, adopted, it doesn't matter. It's a proven statistics that when guardians are involved with their kids, internal and external, their grades, ACT, SAT, ASVAB, scores, they're kicked out of school less. The truancy is less involved. They, they're, they're less prone to play hooky. They're less prone to cut up in class. And this is called an investment, in, our, in my opinion. You heard me say inside the school or outside the school. What the parents have to do, in my opinion, as a volunteer, mentor, motivational speaker, is get more involved with their kids. You can't send a kid to school and expect the, the teachers to raise them. We got to raise our kids at home. My grandfather told me that charity begins at home and spreads abroad. I didn't know that was going to happen in my life as a little kid, but it did. These investments can happen anywhere. Perennial involvement at home discussion about school, helping with their homework, reading with children. Involvement at schools may include parental volunteering in the classroom, attending workshops or attending school plays or sporting events. I heard you say that 73% of all students are involved with some type of extracurricular activity, mainly sports. But let me tell a story about that. My grandfather was a farmer. He attended one of my games in high school, the only game he ever saw me play live. The rest of the time, he would listen to it on the radio. Notice I said radio. That's how old I am and how old he was. But the game he did attend it, I went up and blocked the shot and just took the ball out the air. The reason I'm sharing that story is that when you see a parent, grandparent, a guardian, when you see somebody in the stands, when you that, that's in your household, when you see somebody in the classroom that's in your household, your adrenaline is going to start flowing. You're going to make sure you're on your best behavior. You're going to make sure you're on your best behavior. And that's where we are failing that lack of involvement. It doesn't matter if it's a parent. It doesn't matter if it's a mentor, a volunteer. We have programs called Watchdogs. Dogs stand for dads are great students. I'm trying to get more women involved. I'm calling my program Man Woman Up University, where we have men and women in the hallways, in the classroom, if they got time. So the kids can see somebody standing over there with a volunteer badge on, and they can tell them, I'm not getting paid. I'm here for you. I'm here to help make this world a better place and to make sure that you don't end up in prison because the penitentiary is just for us. The population in the United States of America, we are about 13.9% of the American population is African-American people, yet the prison system is totally opposite. Why? Because it's, they're, they're, they're soliciting, they're looking for us. And so what are we doing? Falling right into the trap. So we got a mom or dad or somebody out there playing mom or dad, mentoring, volunteering, that's getting into a kid's behind that is not theirs, don't live in their household, then usually that kid will listen to that person. I used to use an example about my daughter to tell people I had a translator and both of us spoke English. Because if another person says something to your child that you've been saying for the last two years, they'll sit there looking straight in the eye and say, I see what you're saying. But all the time when you say it to them, they're going to contradict you because you mom or dad. I know you're feeling me on that. Now, here's another thing that I want to say that we have to really focus on, on parental environment, how it affects our students. When, when they don't get involved in children's education, then the teachers have to play a role creating parental environments. Three frameworks for exploring the persecution to the effects of parental environment have been foundation of the majority of the research for an environment. Each approach highlights a different aspect or dynamics that exist in school, home, communities, and relationships. We got to start off with social etiquette, behavior, teaching our kids how to conduct themselves, how to sit at the table, and how to, how to eat properly. Start from the left, go to the right. Never reach across the table. Have the person next to you eat. Things like that. It's not just at the table. It's anywhere they go. Social etiquette, behavior. Because we're not teaching it to our kids at home. And we don't have any classes that say, we're going to teach you how to, how to conduct yourself in public. What do they do when they look at our kids in low-income area and poverty? We expect the worst, don't we? We expect them not, not, not how to control themselves. We expect them not how to talk to people, not how to handle eye contact, a proper handshake. Well, that's what people like you and I, Tangere and Eric, can come in at by getting involved, going out, spending 15, 20 minutes a day, 30 minutes a day, teaching a brother. When you come and meet somebody, when you shake that person's hand, you give them a firm handshake and look them directly in the eye. There's a big difference when you see a kid come up to you and they drop their head. They're telling you something right then. 
they're telling you something. You gotta learn how to read a person's demeanor instead of what they're saying, because smiling faces tell lies. Smiling faces tell lies. One more thing I wanna cover, and I don't wanna talk too long, is that when you, a kid knows that you care, it don't even have to be a kid, it could be an adult. It could be your significant other. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. When we use empathy with our kids today, because most of them got issues going at their home, most of the time the mom and the kid on the same school bus because the mama had them early, or the mama dropped out of school and decided to come back, or there are drug issues at home, or there's spousal abuse at home, or there's no food at home to eat and the kid is coming to school hungry, and how can you expect the kid to pay attention when their stomach is growling? These are the things that we need to make our teachers understand to be empathetic toward these kids and say, is there anything I can do to help make things better? When you do that, that kid is going to start trying. That's my opinion. I want to stop right there. I don't want to go too far. Listen, I'm, I'm, come on now. I know it's a deacon somewhere in the house. Somewhere. It's a deacon. Yeah, we, if there's a I deacon am, around. I'm going to the offer tray right now, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Look, Eric, 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 I'm going to bring it to you. But let me say this first. I'm about to bring it to you because that was so hot. But you know what I heard? I heard so much self-compassion. I heard so much self-knowledge. I heard so much compassion and empathy and hope and social skills. And this is what we're gonna need if we're gonna be charitable toward others. Listen, let me open up this panel because that was so hot and I know I'm gonna pass the fire off. What was your thoughts about what Big C just said? Who wants to go first? I tell you, I go first. He talked about, if I had to put a title on what Big C was saying, he talked about going directly at the heart of a child, at the heart of education, doing things that make students feel 10 feet tall after you finish talking to them, to make them smile, to make them feel like I can conquer the world and I can do anything. And that's what I get when I listen to Big C talk. And I felt like I, I, felt like I could trust him just in the first few minutes because kids are going to give you about 10 seconds. They're going to size you up to see if you're serious. Is this somebody I need to listen to? And so when he starts talking, you can tell that he did his homework and he did his research. And this is not stuff off the top of his head, but this is stuff that he's actually seen work. So I want to commend Big C on sharing with all the listeners. And if you're listening right now on this radio, it wasn't an accident. Holy Spirit led you there. You were supposed to listen to Big C. And that's all I'm going to say. It wasn't no accident. You were supposed to listen to what Big C had to say. So I definitely Big agree with, with you, Big C. I definitely agree with you, Big C. Oh my goodness, I'm about to, I'm about to get out of my chair right now. Okay, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be good over here. I'm gonna be good over here in this chair. Yeah, people shouting on but, the radio. But um, when you mentioned empathy, that like struck me to my core because I feel like we as a, a educational system do not practice that well. We don't. You have your, your sprinkles, your sparkles, just like us of, you know, teaching children how to be empathetic and compassionate and hopeful and all these other beautiful things to one another. However, as a system, we don't do that very well. We do not do that very well. So when you mention that, like, I, when I tell you, I almost got out this seat. <laughs> so thank you for sharing that. I, I appreciate that. And, and, and you know, that's passion. Mm. Don't even get me started on passion. I'm going I'm to be quiet. I'm just sitting up here listening. I can't wait to hear this next speaker. Tangeray, going to bring it. You didn't already hear me. He's going to warm up the audience for you. <laughs> oh, he did that. You know, I, you know, right now, you know, you guys, right now, a lot of people are talking of focus. I'll say they're, fo they're so focused on social mobility, you know, status quo. They're so focused on economic uh efficacy and efficiency and bonding is almost like a lost art I mean, we, but the kids are teaching us the kids they love on each other but as we get older it's, it's like that becomes you know not as important as making money bringing home the bacon right and it's because I believe the way this society is set up, right? And then you want to throw something else in the mix. You got 
inclusion, diversity, racial equity, not just in school communities, but also in, in employment, right? So we need, we need leaders, we need educational leaders, we need organizational leaders, we need community leaders to, to team up, to get on board, right? And that's why we want to bring in uh, our next guest. I think this is the first time, but it won't be her last <laughs> on the podcast, Sanctuary Reporter. Please tell us, I just want to thank you so much for being here. Let us know what you got going on currently. Yes, yes. First of all, like you said, it will not be my last. You're stuck with me now. You guys, I'm adopting you guys as my brothers at this point. Uh, so uh, some of the things I got going on right. currently, I am currently still in the classroom. Um, I, I love what I do, but um, with launching my, my consulting program or consulting business, it has been such a joy to take what I'm what I've been doing in the classroom outside of those four walls and teaching other teachers how to basically do what the, what you guys are talking about of just creating positive classroom environments but with the art. Because the art naturally teaches all of these things. It teaches compassion, empathy, um, growth mindset, development, personal development. I can go on and on about that. So um, I currently do professional developments in organizations and, and um, schools. Wherever you need me, I am. That's where I am. <laughs> um, so that's currently what I got going on uh, currently right now. Wonderful, wonderful. You know, we got Eric Cork on here with us too. And you know, when I think about all three of you, I, I think about fine arts. Uh, also, I think about physical education, right? <clears throat> and but these are uh, extracurricular activities or tools for teachers to use, you know, for enrichment, right? And these enrichment courses are, are felt from general population to gifted education. But all our kids need this type of enrichment, right? And so with that being said, Tangent Reporter, how are you and your team continuing to cultivate connections with high expectations in mind, right? We're talking in the classroom and outside the classroom. While modeling, while role modeling, while demonstrating uh, those various levels of community involvement that the parents can see? And how are you offering parents, if you are offering parents, opportunities to get involved, right, with what you're doing? And and I believe what you're doing is very diverse and you have a variety of uh, strategies and ways that you implement uh, what you do, right? But uh, what are some of the opportunities that you give your clients to get engaged and get involved, and, as well as your team, to help cultivate those connections? Awesome, awesome. So as I stated before, the name of my business is Cultivated Connections, and um, that that was a divine down, download from, you know, my Lord and Savior. I believe it, that he gives us the things that we need to put out into this world. Um, so when I first received this, this question, it was like, whoa, this is so big. But then I had to break it down to those big key points. Cultivate connections, high expectations, levels of community, variety of opportunities for engagement. That's how, you know, I was processing this question. And when I started, thought about cultivating connections, cultivating connections, you know, first I first immediately thought about how do we teach children how to cultivate a connection within themselves? Especially now, in today's world where we are, even us as adults, are so engaged with social media. Not that there's anything wrong with it, but it has caused us to desensitize with what we are doing with ourselves. So that's point one of just, you know, I, I, work, I love working with my team to help them help children and, and parents as well. I've done this with parents too, of cultivating this relationship with yourself. And most of the time I do that with like body awareness, mindfulness, mindfulness techniques. There's so many studies out there that, that tell you that, you know, practicing mindfulness, meditation, whatever, however mindfulness looks like to you, because it doesn't always mean you're sitting down and you're quiet, <laughs> um, that it allows students to to grow. It allows students to truly concentrate, truly be aware about what they're feeling. 
um, the next thing that I was thinking about was like high expectations. Like that's such a buzzword in the educational community right now. So it means different things to different people. For me, I always think about, well, high expectations, my expectation for a student, person, anything is more so not necessarily about the academics. Yes, they come, but it's more so, are you respectful? Are you engaged in, in the conversation or the activity that's in front of you? Are you participating? So when I think high expectations, especially in the classroom, I immediately go towards that, like respect, engagement, participation. Those are my, my three things that I look for first. And, of course, you have to cultivate that in the classroom, right, and outside the classroom. Um, I also thought about, like, the levels of the community, that is such a big word. Community is such a big word. You got your classroom community. You got your outside of the classroom community. But um, first things first is if we're talking about parental involvement, we as educators at schools have to do better, like I mentioned earlier, with communicating with the outside community, meaning that's our parents. What are we doing to ensure that we're bringing them in instead of pushing them out. Because I know for sure I've had parents talk to me personally again that say, well, I don't know what that means. Like, are we doing a good job at breaking these things down so that parents aren't feeling uh, inferior to educators um, or the school or institution? And so those are just how, you know, that's just the top part <laughs> of just where, where my brain was going. Uh, earlier today when, when I saw, saw that question and really tried to dig deep with it. Uh, one way that I've been doing this with uh, both parents and students, I love, I use social media to my advantage. So I love like going live and just sharing like things that parents can do and teachers can do, but pa what parents can do at home to cultivate that, that creativity at home, because that is an extracurricular activity, but it doesn't have to be extra. It can be very much so embedded in your household every day. Um, but that's, that's my take so far. <laughs> See, and, and Kendra, I don't know if you, you know what you said or not, but it was so many layers. See, okay, it was so, uh, it was so in depth, okay, what you said, because what I heard was not only are you engaged with your scholars and your, your parents, but you, you're teaching them how to cope with not being perfect. So many people, uh, are coping with perfection or being perfection perfectionist and, and I believe that that takes parents out of the loop as well because they don't know I mean they and then they they take it personal because they don't know you know how to talk their educated talk you know what I mean and so and then they don't know when to quit they don't know when to quit it's like okay you know, the ones that are engaged, they sometimes they don't balance it and they, they kind of go a little bit overboard. We all do, right? And so it's, right. what I heard and what you said is matching the time commitment to the value of the expectation, to the value of the assignments, to the value of working cohesively with those uh, educators that's working with the kids. Because at the end of the day, you know, I treat the kids like I'm servicing them. Like I, I, I'm providing a service, I, I am, I, I'm a servant and I'm serving them. And you know, not, not just that they're the client, but I'm serving them because I love to serve, right? And so in serving them, I have to fill in gaps. If the gap is, okay, now I need to be a surrogate dad, right? Or a surrogate parent to help fill in those gaps then we just do or connect them with someone to help them fill in those gaps. And so that's, this is how I hear you setting those goals. This is how I hear you focusing in on those improvements. This is how I hear you saving lives. Okay? And that's why we had to bring you on the panel because to, we got heroes on this panel tonight. <laughs> we got heroes on this panel tonight. We got uh, panelists on here that have went in to the trenches. I know personally Big C, um, Caldwell, he has gone even into prisons. And so he, I mean, he has no boundaries, but let me open up the panel real quick. You know, gentlemen, what's your thoughts about what you just heard from um, Tanjue Porter? Uh, I heard her say that, you know, her Lord and Savior, and I believe that she talked about divine downloads. Did you hear that big scene when she said that? 
Yes, yes, indeed, I sure did. So if you're a listener out there, tonight is your night. It wasn't no accident. Put your hands on the radio right now and let the spirit come on through because everybody on this panel is a believer. Woo! And I want you to understand that this is not an accident that you're listening right now. And speaking of divine downloads, when my sister Tangeray was talking and she talked about her business out there cultivating connections, we're just going to speak blessings. We're going to speak doors opening for her right now that she's going to go yes. to all these schools and going to be in the man. God that's going to overflow your calendar with people who are serious about impacting the lives of their children right now. So receive this blessing right now, cultivating connections mm. out there in Nashville, Tennessee. That's just going to be home base. And when you say cultivating connections, Connections. My divine download from that was cultivating connections equals empowering students to know that what they call rejection is often disguised as God's redirection. So move on. Wipe the dust from your feet. And that's what you're going to do when you're cultivating connections. You're just showing them that's God's redirection for you. And I'm not trying to rhyme, but that's what I heard when she was talking right there. And I heard her enthusiasm. I heard her sincerity. I heard her passion. Isaiah Drone, you a bad boy. You bring all these people together, and you just like a magnet for magnificence. That's what you are. Lord, have mercy. Well, I'm humble, sir. You know you the man. Hey, these are not regular ball comps. I'm not saying this because we're on the radio. This is how me and Isaiah Drone talk when we just right, talking on the phone regular. Am, am I lying, Isaiah Drone? <laughs> you tell the truth, sir. You tell I the need truth. to be on the call with Charles. <laughs> oh, no. Hey, hey, let me get on in 30 me, minutes. Me, nothing me, but... Me. Let me put my two cd in on, on Tangeray. Um, you heard me say previously that my grandfather was a farmer and from Arkansas, country boy. The word cultivate means to prepare and use. And that's her cultivate connection. What she's doing with her curriculum is she preparing you for the world. That's exactly what cultivate means. It's, it, it is so profound. The word is so profound, especially when you bring the dictionary word out on what it means. Basically, people think it's just for farming, to prepare and use. They think you're talking about land. No, cultivate means to prepare and use, prepare for use. So if you fall under her curriculum, her guidance, and the empathy that she has, you will be prepared for the world, ready for the world. That's what cultivate means, prepare for use. Charles Big C, did your daddy ever have you out there in those fields working in that hot sun cultivating? He tried to, man, but I quit, and they told me I wasn't going to be nothing because I didn't like getting my hands dirty. I quit after the first day. <laughs> I told so, him I trying, wasn't going to drive no iron horse. getting her hands dirty? She getting her hands dirty? She getting her hands dirty, man. I don't mind getting my hands a little in... dirty. <laughs> let's get let's get deep. We, we we're made of the same ingredients that the earth crust is made. When God created us in the image, we're made of yeah. dirt. If you look at the four ingredients in the earth crust, the same four ingredients in us. Two thirds of the world is water. Seventy percent of our body is water. Same ingredients. Yeah. Same breakdown. Yeah. Yes. I can't break it. Your hands dirty. My goodness. That's the one that's you know, thing I say to my kiddos of like, you're of the earth, so let's connect, you know? <laughs> mm, mm. You know, BC, you said something there, and again, I have, I have to give honor to what honors do. BC, you, you've gone into prisons and you've connected with the brothers and sisters in these prisons, and I know they, I know they thought somewhere in the back of their mind, I wish I would have connected with him before I got here. And you you going in there not only as a minister, but you going in as a parent and you and you He's a minister? Involved. Come on. You didn't know Big C's a minister. I, I didn't know that. I need, I, need, I need to be I need to be ordained, Eric. I, I never I you know I I was told to go to to a, a person and tell them to accept my calling. I did what I was instructed to do, but that hadn't happened yet. I don't have a, I'm not a certified ordained minister. If you have that authority to bless me, I'll come to Houston in the morning. <laughs> uh, we, we're going to have to talk. We're going to talk on the phone because my, my uh, pastor is about to become a bishop. Okay. And so he, gotcha. he's getting his ordination and um, his elevation in August right there. And uh, Isaiah Drone can just make a phone call and hook you up with T.D. Jakes. So, you know, hey. Oh, yeah, now, you don't, don't get me in right trouble person. now. Okay, <laughs> don't get me in trouble, please. Hey, you want to get ordained and preach How you going to get ordained to anybody better stay, than that? Bishop, I'm trying to stay out of trouble. This, I didn't say that. I didn't happen to say that. 
So I didn't say <laughs> that. looking for a minister Please. to be on day. <laughs> right. So, Bishop, okay, this your son talk. I didn't say that. I, I'm, I'm, my hands are clean. Wait, let me, let me say that. Eric Court, did you try? <laughs> Eric Court said that, Bishop, fine, and look him up. And I'm about to ask you a question. <laughs> Eric Court, I'm about to come to you, sir, because you on fire. What you got going on now? What you got going on? Oh, don't ask me that. It's a lot on my plate. I'm transitioning right now. As you, as I said, I'm traveling around in 45 states and five different countries, but God has me doing things that are globally and international and with my panel. And um, I, I want to name some names and drop some names right there. You would know them. The whole country would know them, but I can't do that. And so now, I, you know, I'm, I can't say what's going on right now, but I going into... I just say one of them, he was Martin Luther King's number one financial supporter um, back during the 60s. And he was in Boston, Massachusetts, and I am now partnering with him in some projects that will be going nationwide and internationally as well. I can't name the other partners involved with that, but you would know these names. And so in terms of what I'm doing right now, I have to reinvent myself because when COVID hit, I'm, I'm a national presenter, so I do school assembly programs. So the number one thing that was affected by COVID was assembly programs or any time churches, you know, couldn't have, you know, services because, you know, social distancing. And so that knocked out my business. So for two years, I lived on God and the government. That was it. No checks coming in, went from feast to famine. You know, seriously, I kid you not. And so I just built um, two shed in the background, backyard and worked, and I wrote over 100 books. My granddaughter would say, keep up, you writing a book a day. But, I mean, my, if you go to my Facebook page, you will see my long post. So don't be scared. I, I have a, um, you have, I'm an acquired taste. I'm, I, my people follow me like to read. And if you don't like to read, I'm not the person that you need to follow. <laughs> and so the, I just write what God gives me, and I put it on the thing. Today I wrote a post called uh, Time Travel. And that was my, my, my topic for today. So when you ask me what's going on, bro, Talking to, trying to keep in touch with Isaiah Drone because he's going in a million different directions. <laughs> that's what I, that's what I'm doing right now. I'm not, uh, I'm not gonna say everything like, I'm involved in. You you got me laughing, but you said now you said something that was so rich, and, and I caught it. I, I caught it. Big C, I caught it. Okay, wisdom is not taught. It's caught, and I caught something. And what I caught was. What you went through, because you went through it, you're not still in it, okay? What you went through is called new wine skin. Because you've been doing, you've been doing assemblies, you've been vendoring and doing these events for 30 plus years. And sometimes when, no, not sometimes, all the time when you are faithful in something, that God gave you, he's going to increase it. But you have to go through a process. And when you were talking, I was thinking about cake mix. Isn't that crazy? Because if you take a box of cake mix, you can't eat that. And if you do, you get sick. But it has to go through a process where it's broken down. And then it has to go through the mix. But while it's going through the mix, it's going through all these different ingredients and it's changing different forms. And it's, as it's changing forms, it becomes sweet, but it's still not ready. It's still got to go through the heat. And so now it has to be poured into a pan, oh, a vessel, a new shape. Then it has to go through the fire. As it's going through the fire, there's a time limit on how long you can cook it, okay? And if you take it out the oven before it's time, even though it smells good, even though the aroma, the fragrance is flowing through the house, it'll fall. And so God has a way of keeping us in that oven, that furnace, until we're well done. Because then, you can be served. So sometimes I feel like we go through situations so we can be served or serve people on another level. And so with that being said, let me ask you a question. What practical ways can 
school administrators based off your experience? Motivate well, first of all, when you talk about, when Come you on. say wine, and oh, you can't put new wine in old wine skin, so you got to complete that statement if you're going to be dropping revelations. You cannot put new okay. wine Come in on. old wine skins, so I got to have new wine Come skins on. to match the new wine. Right, right. Oh, thank you for clarifying that. I, I should have did that. You, see, you the preacher. But let me go back to this question, though. <laughs> let me go back to this question, though. Based off your experience. Uh, how can these school administrators continue to motivate parents post COVID-19 and how can they continue to get them involved in the school system, especially coming out of COVID-19 where, you know, you know, people weren't coming around school and there were masks, everything was locked down, everything was closed, there was no access. What are we going to do now to start bringing, to start bringing these parents back into the fold? Well, the first thing you got to do is you got to create a welcoming school climate where let them know, you know, we have safety protocols and, and whatnot, and it's a welcoming environment that we're glad to have these students back. And we're not acting scared, but we're here to do what we are ordained and called to do. And the second thing they can do is to involve the parents is, is provide those families with information related to child development and creating supportive learning environments, and they can establish effective school to home and home to school communication. Those lines got to be broken. Uh, Charles Big C Caldwell, I'll let you know, when the enemy wants to shoot down and, and engage in battle, the first thing they're going to take out, the first person is to communicate, the man with the radio. Am I right, Brother Big C? They're going to take yeah, out the radio man, and you, and, you and you don't salute and you don't salute the, the captain out there so that they can see you in the trees. Hold on, that's saluting. That's, I'm going to kill him. So what they do is get, clean out, you clean out that, you break that bar of communication. And so when you establish that school to home and home to school to communication, that's crucially important. And you strengthen the family's knowledge and the skills and support to extend their children's learning at home. Let them know it's not, this is not just where they go to, school, go to school to learn, but you learn at home. And it's an extension of what was going on in the classroom. And you engage those families. In school planning and leadership and meaningful volunteer information, just don't have them just picking up trays and, and just getting apple cores and sweeping the floor. But I'm talking about meaningful volunteer opportunities where they feel like they're actually involved in the uh, experience, the learning experience of their child and bringing them up and understanding that they are partners in that education. And we connect those students and families to community resources that strengthen and support those students' learning and their well-being, which goes back a full circle to what Charles Big C. Caldwell was talking about when he said compassion and empathy. And you're dealing right there. You're not working with a computer. You're working with an actual human being. This is the best that family had to offer right there. And the best way for me to answer your question right now, Brother Isaac, Drone is to give you real life experiences of what I would talk about in my workshop. I would bring a teacher up and I would sit her in a chair. I sit him in a chair and then I would put on like Jaws music. And I get on the floor and I start crawling toward him. Right? And so I'm like, what's going on? What's going on? Here? Well, what I'm doing is I'm saying, there's a rumor going around. There's a rumor going around this school right now that editing and revision. You know what that means when that comes out of your mouth? That means to a child writing the same thing over in neater handwriting. And that's not what it means. It means all these other things that they need to do in terms of ha having their paper, like fixing capitalizations, making punctuation changes, stopping runaway sentences, replacing illegal words, add adverbs and adjectives, does it flow like a pro, and all these other things like that. So I had the parents put that on the refrigerator. And so I said, this is how you're going to be involved in the paper. And so when these kids bring these papers home, you know, go write that over again and turn it in. No, which so I, there's this rap that I would do um, to back that thing up. So I put on the music, dun, 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 dun. You can write it by the page here, but the stage here of the writing process where you get your grades here is when you read what you wrote. Then fix it up, yeah, check and run away sentences of how many ands, so's, buts, because, dot, 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 bam. Girl, you're writing good still. Back that pen up. Boy, you're not finished till you back that pen up. Never fall in love with you. Back that pen up. First draft copy up, back that pen up, and it just goes on and on. And so the parents have that posted on the refrigerator, Isaiah, and when these kids bring these papers home, no matter what grade they're in, the parents go over it again. They say, all right, let's go over this paper. Did you fix your capitalizations? 
Bam! Did you make your punctuation change? Did you put some commas in there? Because they write the way they talk. They get text messages right now in their phone. As we're on this radio interview with Isaiah Drone from Dallas, Texas right now, they have text messages with no capital letters. They have text messages with no periods and no commas. I would send messages to my boys, and I would text them, and I would be the running joke. They would be running joke. Your daddy send you another book. Because I would have capitalization and punctuations all through in this story, and I would write like a whole paragraph to my boys, and I would send them text messages. And the parents are looking at the paper. Did you stop all these runaway sentences and all, getting away all these run-ons? Did you replace all these baby words with some more, instead of saying happy, sad, good, bad, meaning a lot, I teach those are baby words. No, we use words like excited. We use words like enthusiastic. We use words that are indicative of the grade level they're on, and I'm not here to show you how smart I am. I'm here to show you how smart you are. That's my job as an educator. Let's add some adverbs. Let's sprinkle some adjectives on it. Let's give it some flavor. Let's give it some seasoning. So mama is in the kitchen. Dad is in the kitchen showing that student how to improve their writing, to make it better than it's ever been before, and they become better writers. They become more literary experts because you're helping the whole family now, and it becomes an experience of learning. It becomes an experience of engagement. It becomes an actual family affair. Bum, bum, da, dum, bum, bum. It's a family affair. It's a family affair. That's what it's all about. So I'm just freestyling off the top of my head. Does it flow like a pro? That's what I'm talking about. Does it have some continuity? It's not one whole ocean of paragraphs, but do you have to be separated in paragraphs? What is a paragraph? Do you know what a sentence is? A paragraph is not just a bunch of words put together. Everyone in your family is what to each other? Everybody in your family is related to each other. That means every sentence in that paragraph must be related to a single topic. And if you're talking about something different, indent. And start a new paragraph. And that helps the readers breathe. So when I go into a school, I know what principals want. They don't want all this hype energy. They want results. They want outcomes. They want to improve and increase data. That's what your principal wants out there in Tennessee, Ms. Porter. You know that. They want to, our test score is going to go up. Yep. That's what they spend their money on. That's what they invest their time and attention on. Every meeting a principal goes to, they talk about data, 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 and then some more data. That's what they want to know. That's what they want to know. The numbers are their test scores going to go up. They want to be able to keep their job. They want to be able to be promoted. So all this parent involvement must also involve the academic rigor and relevance of the actual learning and the curriculum the students are doing. Otherwise, it's just a feel-good moment, and when you make the principals feel good is when you raise test scores and students will not raise test scores unless they feel they have the capacity and you have ignited the fire and I'm, I'm going to answer this question the last way uh, one of the guests on your show tonight was um, going to be Mr. Chris Carter he might even still be on it now and I remember at the start I said I wish I had his question <laughs> at what point did your life decide you to become a, a youth advocate right there I wasn't even planning on doing this Isaiah Drone for a living not at all. Brother, my God, I was a writer. I was a basketball player, and I'm just doing, I'm doing this poetry. And I was going into classrooms doing, like, um, writer in residency for the University of Houston. I would teach kids about poetry, and, and I was kind of getting known around the city. I went to my daughter's orientation when she went to middle school. She's in sixth grade. And I'm sitting up beside the PTA president, who is my neighbor, this guy named Fletcher Simpson. We're sitting there, and the superintendent shows up at the school, and he says, uh, you only scored 40% last year, which is unacceptable on the state level. And what we're going to do, we're going to go up 10% to 50% this year. And then we're going to go up to 6 Then we're going to go to 70 80 and 90 And this is a five-year project, and we're going to get you up into the 90 percentile. Give yourselves a round of applause. Woo! And everybody starts clapping. Isaiah Drone, I'm the only one in the room. Out of 600 people in this room, I'm the only one not clapping. I said, I don't get it. He said, what do you mean? It sounded like he just pimp slapped everybody in the face. He said, what do you mean? He said, 50% are going to pass this year, which is a 10% increase. So in my mind, I thought, well, what about the other 50? So you're just telling these parents to their face that half of y'all kids are going to fail. That's what you just said to everybody in their face. Half of the kids in the school are going to fail. So I'm not a person. If you're not a part of the solution, you're a part of the problem. Am I right, Big C? Am I right, Big C? You are absolutely correct. Absolutely so I said, let me let me make myself a part of this solution. I'm a writer for a magazine. I'm an editor for this magazine. So I said, listen, I'll come and I'll work with the students who are taking the test because I don't I don't want to accept that laying down on my back that you're just going to let half the students fail. And so he said, what you want to do? I said, let me say, let me uh, I'll come talk to the students who are taking the test. He said, Mr. Court. Do you know there's over 500 students and these are eighth graders and your daughter just in sixth grade? You can work with our eighth graders? I said, yeah. I said, he said, I said, which ones? And, uh, he said, which ones? I said, the ones who are taking the test. He said, there's over 500. And I, so I said, bring them into the cafeteria. And he said, how long do you want them? And the words out of my mouth, 
Miss Tangere, this had to be the anointing of God because I had never done a student workshop before. I had never done a student assembly ever in my life. He said, how long do you want them? And words out of my mouth was, what time do they get on the bus? What? Mr. Yeah. Court, that's, that, that's six and a half hours. You want 500 eighth graders for six and a half hours by yourself? I said, yeah. We're going to talk about writing, bring them there. So um, I had just got to visiting my dad in Indianapolis, and I didn't know my dad, so I wanted to get something to remember him by, so he had a sack of clothes sitting right there in his hospital room in Indianapolis, Indiana, so I took a pair of his boxer shorts, and I put them in my, my, my pocket, and I took them out, and I told my daughter, yeah, I stole a pair of daddy drawers. It was, it was clean, <laughs> and so I just said, I'm going to take this back so I can have something to remember my daddy by, because they said he was going to die, and so I'm sitting there, and so right on the heels of that, he asked me how long, so I said, what is the name of this workshop? I done put my foot in my mouth, I said, I'm going to come and do this writing workshop for six and a half hours for 500 eighth graders, and I had never done an assembly program, so Bishop T.D. Jakes, if you're listening right now, I want you to know, this was my David and Goliath moment. I showed up to get my brother's lunch. But I didn't know that Goliath was out there talking about my God, saying my God can't do this, my God is the sorriest God ever in the history of planet. I'm listening, I'm like, David, who is this uncircumcised philosopher talking about my God? You're going to tell me that half of my students are going to flunk? That's what you're saying right now? Oh, not on my guard. So I brought him in, and I put a pair of my daddy's boxer shorts on a big poster board. And I said, the name of this workshop today is OSSD, with the letters going straight down. And what that stood for, Aunt Tangeri, stood for Operation Shock Some Draws. Because they don't think y'all going to pass the test. So we're going to shock some draws in the district. That's what we're going to do. We're going to shock the whole city. Y'all think y'all think going to pass? So that was a whole workshop. And I, people will follow me on Facebook who were teenagers at that workshop. They still follow me to this day. And they'll tell you about this whole story. So they missed the court. So I was in the neighborhood. I'd be pumping gas and going into the convenience store. And I would see these eighth graders. And they would come in and go, Mr. Court, what's up, Mr. Court? We're going to shock some draws, man. We're going to shock some draws. That became the whole theme of that whole school year. To make a long story short, they went from 40% to 84%. They doubled their scores and they had the number one writing scores in the city. They didn't go to 50, not 60, not 70, 84% from 24. And my name became known all over the city. And that was the kids. They said, because they wanted to prove a point. And that's what we call it now more politically correct, so I wouldn't call a workshop that now. I'm just hearing that with your, you know, your listeners right now. So that's what it was called right now. The workshop was called Course Coast to Coast Classroom, so I'm more politically correct. See, Charles can get away with that. Big C can get away. I can't get away with that now. So that's what I call the workshop. So they doubled up their scores, and everywhere I go, test scores go up. One school I went to, they were only 10%, and 0% mastered the objectives. That meant out of the 10% who passed, which means 90% failed, out of the 10% passed, zero mastered the objectives. I worked with those students twice, and I worked with the teachers once. I came in, they went from 10% to a perfect 100 in one year. They wanted to test them because they all black. Oh, y'all must have cheated. Y'all, must, y'all can't go from 10 to 100. Test them. It don't matter. Because I, I was given mastery skills. I do not believe in mediocrity. I don't believe in average. I don't believe in ordinary. I believe in excellence because you can do all things that you place your mind toward. And that's what I tell these students. I give them this infection of energy. I make the hair stand up on the back of these kids' neck when I talk. And that's what I give them. You have the confidence. You can do all things. That's what I tell them right now. And I let them know if I say you can do it, you can do it. And I want you to know you have a power that's in you right now that you haven't even tapped into it. I'm going to tap into it. They went from 10% to 100%, but here's the part. They went from 0% to 86% who mastered the objectives. That means the 100% students, percent of the students who passed, 84% of them scored perfect scores. That's why they thought they were cheating. What'd they do? Oh, this man came over. He told us we can do it. They were talking about me. I, I didn't have a name, and they just called me this man. And so that's when my that name started getting spread all over the city. That was in part so that's, that's what I we did. I, you listen, I'm telling you right now, I, he's not just talking. I, I witnessed it. I, I, I witnessed it. And I was like, how many people they got going in presenting? It, it was only one man. I, I said, but he, but he had the children in there all day. All boys, all boys. Oh, he had them in there all day. The thing I like about God, what I love about God is so many things, but one of the things I love about him is he has this power to make and create brilliant people like Charles Bixie Caldwell, Tangere Porter, Eric Court, and Chris Carter, who, who couldn't make it tonight. And all we're saying tonight, listeners, is there, there are others, there are others 
There, there's a young Tangeray Porter out there that needs some guidance. There, there's a young Big C Caldwell out there that needs guidance, that needs to be developed. There's a young Eric Cork out there that needs to be, to, that needs to know who they are, that needs to walk into their purpose. If he's a young Eric Cork, he needs he need a spanking. <laughs> Listen, we out of time. What's the takeaway for the night, y'all? Y'all, I love y'all. What's the takeaway for the night? We out of time. Who wants to go first? Cultivating connections. You already said it. We ain't got to think of nothing. Yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, but I'll definitely hop in first. Uh, as you was talking, my dear brother, uh, the, the thing that popped up in my head um, was art, authenticity, and energy which is all the three things I live by, but just showing up as yourself authentically as, as a role model pushes students and parents and everybody else who interact with you to show up and uh, show up as themselves authentically. So uh, that's my takeaway for tonight. I can definitely say that. Listen, we out of time, but Big Big C, what you got for us? What you <laughs> okay, do me, a, do me a favor, Ali3. Answer that question over yeah. again, man, so I can read. Because I've been listening to my man Eric, bro, and he took me around the block. Bring me back to where we at. Okay. So, how are we going to bridge the gap? Just let him say what's on his heart. Don't, 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 don't bring it back nowhere. What you thinking right now? What's in your spirit? Just let it out, Big C. Go ahead. You take up okay, the spirit. Right in my spirit. I'm going to tell you what's in my spirit right now. Eric, when you spoke of your trials and tribulations, that's my life. And I'm quite sure Tangerine has been through some things that ID3 have also. Here's my, here's, my, here's my story. The Apostle Paul said you have to remain content in all situations. It is strange on how all of us want to be on the top of the mountain, but once you reach to the top of the mountain, you're not growing anymore. When you're in the gutter, when you're in the valley, when you're climbing, that's when you're being shaped. That's when God is carrying you. That's when you're being formed. That's where you can walk into a classroom and automatically get the kids attention to where they won't go to the bathroom is because of your struggles. When we are being made, when God created us from dirt, then we are formed. We are formed and we are shaped in iniquities to where he can use us. He knows that we're going to be servants. He knows mm. that we're going to be doing what we're doing right now. He knows mm. what we're going to do 10, 20, 30. When he said, I'm out for Omega, he's the beginning and the end. He knows the decisions uh. we're going to make, the choices we're going to make. He knows the problems that we're going to walk into. But as uh. long as we lean on him, he's going to carry us. So when you're going through trials and tribulation, each and every person listen to me right now. Come on. Embrace it. Kobe Bryant said embrace the hate. I'm saying embrace the trials and tribulations. That's where you're being formed. All you got to do is just sit there and wait. Be content. Wait on the Lord. And I guarantee you when you come out, you can demand the attention from a person that can't even hear. He going to be looking at you, reading your mouth. Go ahead on. Listen. That, listen, we out of time. It's a wrap. I, I respect all y'all time. We got we to gotta do this again. Can we do this again? That's a Charles Simpson. Amen. Let's do this again. Let's do it again. Look, I, I hear an organ. I don't know if I'm hearing things, but it's like I hear a gospel organ in the background okay. playing Let the Church Say Amen. <laughs> amen. Let's pass that collection play, y'all. Who is that? Eric, that's no, Eric Court. You got. Is that a sound bite? We need that. We need that. Uh, this is the Tangeray right here. This is the Tangeray. Hey, Tondra. Yeah. No, I'm not. All right, we're listening. Y'all have blessed me tonight. They, oh, they were. They, they were. <laughs> well, listen, this was Tondra. Tondra, all of his, all of his radio shows ain't like this. He, he, he just put the wrong people together. That's what happened. He, he messed up. No, no, this is perfect. This is perfect. Nice. In fact, tonight, it is at English Ship. Love y'all. Good night. Spotify, follow up.
Facebook, Instagram.